welcome to Connect of the Dead. Uh, this episode's guest needs no introduction whatsoever, so I am not going to waste any time. Ladies and gentlemen, George Mahalka. George, how are you today? I'm really well, thank you. And how are you? Great. Thanks so much for doing this. A pleasure. Um, of course, your iconic movie, My Bloody Valentine, everybody continues to talk about it. This is like 40 some years later now. What's it like yeah. having that kind of a film under your belt? Well, you know, I mean, it's always a surprise in a way, one way. You know, when I was first making that film, I was 27 years old. And, you know, um, I just wanted to make a good film. That's you know? it was your it's your second listed credit on IMDb. That's correct. So yeah. Really yeah. early in your yeah. career. Yeah. yeah. And it was, you know, I've never done a horror film before or anything even close to it. You know, most of the most of the films that I'd done before that were either the shorts or the uh, the feature that I did before Bla Valentine were comedies. So this so, is a huge departure for you. It was an absolute departure for me. It was something totally strange and totally different. But yet the next couple of films you did seem to fall into that genre. Well, you know, I mean, one, I kind of, I kind of, uh, how would I say that? You know, I got kind of affectionate towards that genre. <laughs> and also in those days, you know, people were much more pigeonholed. Well, I know, I'm not sure they're more, more pigeonholed now than before, but you know, the success of Valentine sort of, um, made everybody, um, want me to make more horror films or, or that kind of adventure or, 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 you know, kind of tense stuff. And obviously as a young filmmaker, you know, um, you want to make films. So if somebody gives you an opportunity to make another film, you take it, you know? And since I didn't have a particular problem with that genre, I said, well, why not? <laughs> you know, That's fair enough. Now, it almost looks like, and I just realized this training or horror seems to be the training ground for people in film because a lot um, of big stars start in horror. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think one of the reasons for it is horror is like the blues, you know, it's um, once you learn the, the, the tropes and the chords, you can play it quite easily and then you just got to put soul into it. You know, and so I think for a lot of young filmmakers, it and, and horror is also one of the few genres left where you can actually put in a visual style of your own. And if it works, you can get away with it and nobody's going to question it until after you've shot it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> OK, that's very valid. Now, with this film, too, uh, I think the original cut was like 100 minutes, but the one that actually screened was 90 yeah, and I can't find anywhere where the full length version has ever been screened again. I, what? It's never been screened. The only people who've seen that were the people in the mixing room. Is there any chance of something like that coming down? No, the pipe? never, never. I mean, we found we found about four and a half minutes of lost footage, which is on the latest um, um, DVD uh, from Shout Factory. Uh, <laughs> we're very cool people, by the way. Um, you know, and, um, and that's about all we're going to ever get. Uh, the problem obviously was during the post-production, which was a really, really fast job because of the, the time we had to get it out into the theaters. Um, you know, we didn't start shooting that movie until September and it was out in the theaters in, in, um, on February 14th or 13th, actually. Um, and, and, you know, that's short post-production time, even now with all the digital shortcuts we have. Exactly. So um, what happened was we had the, um, we had the film, we had the cut, uh, we were cutting the negatives. We were also at the same time doing the mix. And at the same time, we sent our editor down to LA to get the MPAA rating. And because of the problems we had with the MPAA and their, uh, their strict um, adherence to whatever weird uh, rules they had in those days um, meant that every day we ended up getting a bunch of other cuts. In other words, you know, uh, in the scene where Happy gets it under the eye, you know, we can't see that in one shot, you know, uh, and, that's how we planned all these special effects where like there, there were the, the, I guess the, um, 
state of the art at the time where we were able to do things for the first time in one shot. So, you know, in the, in the original, uh, the pickaxe goes under his chin and it comes out his eyeball and his eyeball falls out. And that was done in one shot. Oh, wow. You know, now, and because it was done in one shot, we didn't have that many cutaways. So okay. we had to we had to figure out a way of cutting around these things at the same time as carry on the mix. Um, the next day we'd get the same thing again saying, well, you gotta cut out five more frames and you gotta cut out this scene and you gotta cut out five more frames of that shot and so on. So, and, and in those days, obviously it was on, done on negative film, right? So when you took out a square of film, you lost two on the other side also. So they were that specific saying they were that specific. Frames? Oh yeah. To the point where at one point they said, you got to take 10 more frames out. And we said, there's no more shot left. It's just a sound effect. You know? So, so basically what happened was the negative got chopped into little tiny pieces. It wasn't like take out this much. And then we could have saved that. It was take out this much, take out this much, take out this much. It was the death of a thousand cuts. And so um, the scenes where where these things happened, obviously, you know, frame here, a frame there, you lose it. And you can't ever put it back together again. You know, it's not like it's on some hard drive in the corner, you know, where you can finally find it again and re, 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 reconfigure it. It's literally three frames on the floor. <laughs> yeah. And it's gone, you know, and then another three frames and another 12 frames and another six frames and another two frames. And, you know, so, so each day, each night, once we got, once LA closed, um, then we went back to work and tried to cut the negative to that and try to um, cut the master ma soundtracks to match that and get the composer in to, to fix his music, to make it fit again, you know. So that's what we spent three weeks on night and day until basically, you know, at one point I said, you know, this is no longer my bloody Valentine. This is my anemic Valentine. But, you know, <laughs> it's bleeding out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but anyway, you know, I mean, luckily enough, the, the acting and the story itself and the, and the way it was shot and the tension involved still made it work, you know. How hard is it to fight against the MPAA? Because like this is literally a battle between R and X at that point. Yeah, well, that, in those days it was almost impossible. You know, uh, one we were Canadian, so we had no real oomph behind us in terms of weight. Um, we we were Canadian. It was Paramount. Paramount at the time. Um, even though they made some money on the on their previous horror film, weren't really horror film fans. I know. I mean, it's understandable. You know, I mean, that was not their business. And um, we were Canadians. They didn't know anything to anybody. You know, it wasn't like, you know, they grew up together on the golf courses in L.A. And uh, so basically we were we were the um, I guess, you know, in a sense, the the whipping boys, you know, they could make an example of us. And in those days, you know, there was like maybe a couple of hundred X-rated cinemas that played porn. We were we were slated to open in 1,200 theaters across the US and Canada. Exactly. So the amount of money that already went into it and the, you know, the bookings and, and so on, there was just economically, it didn't make sense for uh, Paramount or anybody else to fight it because it had to come out on bloody Valentine on Valentine's day. Right. So, um, they decided to take the, uh, the path of least resistance, which was to cut it down and hope the hell it'll still work. So if you'd had a stronger production company and more time, you might've had a bit more fight. Um, I don't think it was a question of the stronger production company. I think it was a question of the fact that we were Canadians and, and, um, there was a major, major at the time, let's not forget that uh, Canadian films were 
making major headways in the in in box office in, in the U.S. at the time. Um, um, Meatballs just made over a hundred million dollars, which was a record. Porky's beat that. Um, you know, there was a bit there was a bit of a of a of a backlash towards Canadian successes because that money wasn't going into Hollywood; it was coming back up here. So, you know, I mean, I think a lot of that had to do with that too, you know, but, you know, it is what it is, you know. Um, gotcha. Well, it made it what it is. Yeah. Like it is still a, a classic. And uh, one of the, uh, the effects I heard was uh, enough to give you a little bit of a, an ill feeling. Um, well, you know, I mean, basically most of the effects did, <laughs> you know. I mean, they were really, really good. Tom, Tom, and uh, the gang was just, you know, at the top of their art at the time. And um, um, you know, I mean, every time we saw them, we'd all go, "Oh my god!" <laughs> you know, there was one particular one which was, I think, um, the um, the open chest of Mabel with the heart out and so on that just looked so real that I just went, "Ugh." <laughs> you know, so everybody thought I got sick. <laughs> well, yeah, too, because when you're dealing practical, it's got to look as real as possible. Exactly. Exactly. And, it, and that shit did, man. You know, <laughs> you know, it really looked good. So now you went from that one and you did one called off the office party, or I guess in some some districts it's called hostile takeover. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. Yes. And, and again, I understand distributors get a hold of it and they turn it into whatever they want. Yeah. Um. What was the genesis of that? Like, was this to to keep you in that horror genre? Uh, not really. You know, that was actually more. Um, uh, I was trying to do something weirdly postmodern, but within that, within the the, the thriller genre. And um, I read this book called The Office Party, and I really liked it. And um, I, uh, that's a strange story. That I happened to be in Cannes at the time. And um, I met up with um, uh, Nick Stiliadis from, um, at the time it was SC Entertainment in, in Toronto. And we had a couple of drinks and we hit it off and he says, is there anything you want to do? And I said, well, I just read this book. I'd love to make that into a movie. And he said, okay, let's do it. It was that easy. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, um, Another guy called George Flack, who was um, um, a, an acquaintance and a and a, um, and a, and a an entertainment lawyer, was involved in it, and uh, we put the uh, the deal together and hired a guy called Steven Zoller, who's now become one of my dearest friends, to write the screenplay. And uh, we had the opportunity of having David Warner, who's this fabulous, fabulous actor in it, and. Um, um, Mike Ironside and um, and uh, John Vernon and his daughter, you know, and um, it was it was just a really weird nihilistic concept of of this meek mild guy who decides to hold everybody hostage for no reason, you know. And I still love I still love the uh, the one line in it, which is "Put down the gun and take a couple of weeks off." <laughs> You know, it was a very surreal, very, very, very surreal um, show that I, it's one of my close, I, I love the, I love that movie before it got obviously taken over by the, uh, the distributors, but you know, it is what it is. Was one there day a, I'd love to do a director's cut on that. I was just going to say, was there a lot of changes that were made compared to what you envisioned? Yeah. I mean, the, um, the weird psychological surreal background was taken out quite a bit. Okay. You know? I mean, it's still, there's some parts where you can't not do it. So they have to keep it in, which is what the problem was because then all of a sudden from a, uh, from what looked like a, 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 a cliched a kidnapping story uh, turned into sometimes kind of weird. But like it was said, one of those where, you know, it's like my grandfather always used to say, you can't sit on the same chair. It, it can't sit on two chairs with the same ass, <laughs> you know, and um, 
unfortunately, it it, it that's that that's become the uh, the failure of that film, is that some of that weird surrealism uh, did not was not introduced early enough in the film, and by the time it got introduced halfway through, everyone went, "What the fuck is that?" That seems out of left field. Yeah, yeah, you know, okay. you know it is what it is. Well, I know, like you said, Michael Ironside was that. You've gotten to work with amazing cast of people over the years. Like there's Michael Bean from 24 yeah. Hours. And yeah. the one, and this is going to lead into my questions about television series, was Mr. T. You actually directed oh, some of the episodes of T and T. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a lot of fun. You know, <laughs> I, just, I just came back from France. I shot I shot in France for two and a half years on a, um, on a, on a British, American, French co-production called... William Tell, Crossbow, The Adventures of William Tell. And that was sort of basically armor and horses and, uh, you know, and in an action adventure. And I came back to Canada and I got a call from a guy called John Ryan to see if I could uh, be available for some TNTs. And I said, what's that? <laughs> And said, well, it's this half hour action adventure comedy with Mr. T. And I said, what the fuck? Why not? <laughs> you know, it's going to be I, I had a great time with Mr. T. <laughs> I had a fabulous time with Mr. T. I ended up doing their um, a TV movie for them called Straight Line, which I kind of like, still like. That's one of the questions I wanted to ask because on IMDb, you're credited with directing episodes one and four, yeah. but episodes two and three do not have a director listed. I have no idea what that is, but okay. I didn't. I, that was the the um, the straight line movie was the a TV movie that was a, a an app, ninety minutes that kicked off the first season, the second season of 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 Mr. T. Okay, so, uh, what it looks like they took the movie and broke it into individual episodes. For and our... afterwards, they broke it into individual episodes, yeah, but it started okay. off as a um, and you know what was fun about that it was. You know, um, we got to, I got to use some of Rough Trade's um, music in it, you know, which at the time was very cool and totally different than anything else, you know. And um, it was a lot of fun, you know, and it was about neo Nazis and, um, and, 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 and killing priests and so on. So it's actually kind of, uh, you know, weirdly enough, I think it's kind of, um, speaks to our days today it's it's crazy what stuff like that does now yeah exactly yeah now with that like you you also did da vinci's inquest and yeah. lost like these are like canadian staples if you haven't directed or been in it in any way shape or form you can't be a canadian actor or film <laughs> right like they right. you have to what's what's the new one? flashpoint i guess was the new one that every mm -hmm. canadian has to be in i didn't do flashpoint no oh well, no. well what about Forever Night? That was another one of those. No, movies. no, never did that either. No, at that time, at that time, I was, I was, I was big doing a lot of French Canadian work in Quebec. Okay. Yeah. Well, so what's I, I stayed away from most of those. What's it like? The difference between doing a feature like My Bloody Valentine or Office Party to coming to to television? Um, I've never had a difference. You know, I mean, um, most of my movies even TV or, or film always look kind of cinema, cinema, cinema graphic, you know? Mm -hmm. So I've never, I never made a, 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 a conscious choice that this has to be shot like television. I always shot it the way I thought I should, it should look. And if it meant bigger, wider shots, you know, then I would use bigger, wider shots. And I remember often, you know, producers saying, but this is television. It's a close up medium. And I said, so why do great movies look great on TV? <laughs> very valid point <laughs> you know, i said you know so why why does you know why does ben hur look great on tv you know um well because it's got great shots in it you know so i never i never had that problem you know it was just a matter of learning how to work with more people you know because when you're doing it when you're directing a feature film basically you know, even even today, with all the all the other executive producers and 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 
distributor reps and everybody around you at the village at the at the um, video village, you still have a certain amount of um, of I would say liberty on how choosing your shots and doing your shots. In television, you know you've got to work with a showrunner, and a showrunner is sort of like a um, you know I mean the showrunner is probably one of the biggest jobs in television. You know I mean they create the show, they write it. They have a vision for it, and then you got to share that vision, or or or, you know, compromise their vision to get your vision out. So learning how to do that was probably the most complicated of it, you know. But again, you know, I mean, I've been lucky in that most of the showrunners I've worked with over the years have been very very open to, you know, making, you know, um, like Chris used to say on Da Vinci's Inquest, I want to make that, I want you to make this your own. You know, there's certain beats that are, you need to follow. There's certain things you cannot not do, but how you shoot it is your own. So, you know, I mean, so that's why, you know, I mean, every, every Da Vinci's Inquest season, I get nominated for an award because I was allowed to do what I wanted to do. You know, that's awesome. Um, I do notice that with 24 hour rental, this is the project you told me about when we first met. Um, right. from that point on, you seem to be more on the production side lately. Yeah. Yeah. Is well, you know, I mean, decision? it's, it's something that I've always liked doing, you know, I've always been very production friendly in a way, you know, and I've always enjoyed, um, you know, the, I guess the puzzle of putting a film together, not just from a director's point of view, but from a production point of view. And, um, over the years, you know, I've just enjoyed that. And and then for a few years, I taught at a, at a college filmmaking and um, I got talked into by a dear friend of mine for a six week gig that ended up being four years. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you know, but it was a lot of fun. So I got I got a chance to mentor a lot of young directors. And because of that, I thought, you know, well, maybe I could take some of my street cred and uh, help some younger, young, newer directors, you know, and, and, and put together some of the, or, or put into effect some of the ways I think films should be made, you know, and where the attention should be and where the attention shouldn't be and where you should be spending money and where you shouldn't be spending money and so on, you know? So with 24 hour rental being the real first list on that production side, was that because you're getting into production, you want to do your project or does this because you have a project, you decided I'm going to start production now? Well, with 24 hour rental, it was a different thing altogether. 24 hour rental started off as a gag. It was, um, an idea that we had back in uh, Montreal, back in, I think, 2006 or 2007 or something like that. And um, I've always liked gangster movies and gangster and, and the gangster genre. And I, I loved doing a, a show called Omerta back in, in Quebec, which was an amazing, amazing, I mean, it was a precursor to The Sopranos. Oh, nice. And, you know, we did that before Sopranos ever came out. We actually went to L.A. to try to sell the English version. And then um, a year later, the Sopranos came out. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> so I've always loved that. And this 24-hour rental was just such a, a satire on the whole gangster genre. And um, a friend of mine, Frank Massa and Al Cretina had this crazy um, half hour script that was just to totally out to fucking lunch <laughs> that I said, you know, this would be a lot of fun. So why don't we all get together? So I got a, a few friends of mine um, and we knocked off 48 minutes in three days of, of this of this show. And we just shot it like webcam stuff, you know, really rough and dirty and nasty. 
And what we thought about doing was actually putting it out as five minute sections on, you know, on, on the web. And this was like, just when, when these kind of web shows were, you know, nobody was doing them yet, but everyone was thinking about doing them. And then, um, the producer of it who put up the $10,000 to make it happen, <laughs> um, said, you know, this is too good to give away for free. Why don't you cut it together to two half hours and see if we can sell it? And so I said, okay, fine. You know, I mean, no skin off my nose, you know, I mean, it was just one of those things where, uh, um, it was funny. It was crazy. It was wild. It was something nobody's ever seen before. Um, so we cut it together into two 24 hour half hours, you know, like the, you know, and um, I said, well, I don't know what to do with it really, because I don't think there's a network anywhere who would be willing <laughs> to put this on air. You know, this is just so totally, totally, totally um, antisocial, um, non, non-politically correct. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, so that, that there's no way on earth anyone's going to ever fucking watch this, you know. Um, unless it's on the web for free, in which case it might turn into something kind of crazy and weird. So anyway, um, about six months later, I happened to be in Los Angeles and there's a dear old friend of mine, Tom Barry, um, who's originally from Montreal. We went to film school together. And whenever I was in LA, we'd always get together for an afternoon or an evening, drink copious amounts of alcohol and solve the problems of the world. So he invited me out to his mansion in, uh, in Pacific Palisades, you know, and which he kept saying, you see, if you would have stuck with me right when we were kids, you'd be having one of these too. <laughs> nice. And I said, yeah, but then Tom, I'd have to sell my soul. And he <laughs> said, so what? <laughs> you know? So anyway, um, I, uh, I went to visit him and I said, Tom, I'm in trouble. I promised this guy that when I'm in LA, I'm going to try and shill this, but I don't know what to do with it. You know, I mean, this is crazy and wild and, and, and the shit we used to write when we were kids back in school, but you know, I have no idea what to do with this at all. Uh, but I'd love for you to take a look at it and tell me what you think and maybe point me in the right direction. Maybe somebody out there is interested in this, something like that. Mm -hmm. So three days later, he called me and he said, I want to make it. He wanted to, to back it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he wanted to back it. So we got together a writer's room with Al Cartina and myself and Frank, and we put together the 12 ep or the 13 episodes. And then Tom said, you know, okay, but you've only got a million dollars. That's so all. I said, <laughs> so I said, you want me to do six and a half hours for a million dollars? Well, in that case, I better be the showrunner, the producer. <laughs> <laughs> Time to take on some extra jobs. Yeah, you know, and uh, so then then we put it together. We put it together in Hamilton. Um, you know, I called in a lot of favors from different friends like Romano Orzari, who was starring in Omerta. A lot of the, a lot of the people from that show were from Omerta. <laughs> all dear actor friends. Michael Bean was a, a dear friend of mine from earlier on. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, we shot it in 30 days. Oh, and I, I know he loved that show because every time I talked to him, that's what we ended up talking about was you Michael. Yes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so we shot it in 30 days, which was a record. And we had a lot, a lot of fun making it and Super Channel picked it up good on them, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, it's still so far ahead of its time. It's fucking crazy, you know. That's you know. What, any chance of 24 hour rental too? Or no, no, more season? no, unfortunately, no, no, no the, um, one of the, one of the creators, Frank, let's say got a little weird. Okay. That's because that was 
that was priceless. Those episodes, like that was a great, yeah. great yeah. story. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 just so totally fucked up. You had no idea what's going to happen from one minute to the next, you know. And oh. it is just so so understatedly funny, you know. So anybody out there that has not seen it yet, catch twenty four hour rental. Uh, stick around because uh, I'm going to ask George about uh, the sequel plans he had for My Bloody Valentine, as well as some more little tidbits for Blood in the, or Blood in the Snow. Oh my goodness, sorry. My Bloody Valentine. Stick around. Blood in the Snow is fine. <laughs>